Now let's talk about cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women. In 2018, an estimated 570,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer worldwide and about 311,000 women died from the disease. Cervical cancer is one of the most successfully treatable forms of cancer as long as it is detected early and managed effectively. Yet, a woman dies every two minutes from cervical cancer and it remains the leading cause of death for women in 42 countries. According to the World Cancer Research Institute Fund International, the top 10 countries with the highest rates of cervical cancer in 2020 are Eswatini, Malawi, Zambia, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Uganda, Comoros, Mozambique, and Guinea. These are all African countries. Now, on 17th of November 2022, we will mark the second anniversary of a historic movement celebrating the first time the world has committed to eliminating a cancer, in this case, cervical cancer. Now, elimination means that a country records fewer than four cases of cervical cancer for 100,000 people in sub-Saharan Africa. Incident rates are currently more than 10 times higher. What are the risk factors of cervical cancer? What are the symptoms? What are the treatment options? But more importantly, how can we eliminate cervical cancer in Africa? Joining us to further dig into this conversation is Dr. Chioma Wakama Akano, medical doctor and public health expert. She's also the founder of Smile With Me Foundation, a non-governmental organization which seeks to inspire a healthier Africa through public health. Good morning, Dr. Chioma. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Olive. Good morning. Good morning. So, Chema, let's, Dr. Chema, let's talk to you first of, of all about why there had to be a day for the elimination of cervical cancer. From the introduction, we talked about how it's the most treatable cancer, yet the factors, the numbers are there on the rise. Why is it so important that we have a conversation about elimination of cervical cancer? Thank you, Olive. Um, I'll say... The elimination of cervical cancer is something, or marking the celebration is something that's been long overdue. I believe it got to a point where we could see there were um, replicable strategies from that being seen in other countries, especially developed countries, that could also be implemented in several other countries from the um, developing world. So. We got to that point where WHO and other stakeholders involved were like, you know what, let's actively let the world know that this exists, this is how it can be prevented, and it's a collective duty. It's not just having it in the books or having it in certain documents, but uh, being intentional about publicizing that this is what is on, on ground, cervical cancer, it's preventable, it's taking lives, you know, and here's what you can do as an individual, this is what you can do as a government, this is what you can do as a people to help um, reduce the scourge of cervical cancer. So it's um, long over to you and very welcome, a very welcome development. So what would you say, uh, Dr. Chioma, that is the level of awareness? If we're looking at the fact that it can be treatable if detected earlier, do you think that enough people know about this? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I, I know for a fact that a lot of people don't know. I'm giving you a relatable, um, a relatable evidence or example. I once visited an NYC camp where I was talking about uh, cervical cancer and I asked, you know, how many of you have heard about this? And it would shock you to, to know that I just saw a few hands up. You know, people didn't even know what the virus was, human papilloma virus was, and this is, I, I use an NYSC camp in Nigeria because, you know, that's a place where you have enlightened individuals who have just gone through the university stage and about to, you know, serve their nation. So if there be a group of people who should be enlightened, who are young and who are also most affected, you know, because uh, it starts from the, it's one of the risk factors is early sexual, you know, debut. So if there be any set of people who should know about it, because that's also the phase where it's most prevented. That's the window of prevention. It should be these people. And they didn't know about it. Now talk more of the average woman on the street, the average man on the street. Um, it will also surprise you to know that some people don't even know what a cervix is. They might know what it is when you go deeper in explanation, but the word cervix, as basic as that, 
we still have people who do not know. So I think the awareness level is still very subpar, very minimum. And um, that's why we have days like this, days of action, like the one we're marking tomorrow, to let more people know. It's an everyday affair. However, um, a day of action is a day where you get to really publicize it and blow up um, awareness in several proportions. All right, Dr. Chioma, you've mentioned a very important factor that there isn't enough awareness, which is why we have you here today to shine the light and create awareness. Let's break down these terms. Human papilloma virus, the, the pap smear, the treatment options, how are they all interrelated? Can you please break this down for us and how they're all interrelated? Okay. So I'll start by saying that for the benefit of those here for the first time, cervical cancer is the cancer that affects the cervix. Now, the cervix is the neck of the womb. That's the most basic way I can explain it at the moment. It's the junction between the uterus, that's the womb, and the you know, vagina. So that's where that particular cancer occurs. Now, um, of course, that means it generally affects women, people who have cervixes. Now, um, about the human papilloma virus. Now, the human papilloma virus is a sexually transmitted infection. So, for it to be sexually transmitted, it means men can have the infection too. And most times, it's transferred from the men to the women. So, the human papilloma virus is responsible, especially the strains 16 and 18. They are mostly responsible for about 70% of cervical cancer cases, if not more. So that's, that's why we focus a lot on HPV prevention as a, a very viable means of preventing cervical cancer. So this is not just something for the women. The men also have a role to play because if they prevent HPV as men, you know, it reduces the chances of women getting it. So that's what the HPV is. Of course, there are different strains. Not all strains of HPV cause cervical cancer or cause cancer, you know. Um, there are the low um, strains of HPV, and those are the ones that cause the common genital wax that people know about, genital wax, when you hear wax. But then there are those strains, like I mentioned, the 1618, and a couple of others that are implicated in cervical cancer. So when... Um, that is found when a woman has HPV, especially these strains, she's at risk. But the, 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 the plot twist here is you, most women, in fact, most people will not even know if they're infected because most times it's symptomless. And that's why we focus a lot on cervical cancer prevention because most times when a woman starts exhibiting symptoms of cervical cancer, it has already gotten to an advanced stage. So we focus a lot on prevention. And prevention, we're talking about pap smears. We mentioned pap smears. So there are different levels of prevention. Firstly, um, in this strategy of eliminating cervical cancer, we have the vaccination, that's HPV vaccination. We encourage early cervical uh, um, HPV vaccination in girls and also boys where the vaccines are available. Now for the girl child and for the boys here in Nigeria, we say in between the ages of 9 to 15, in some countries, 11 to 15, you know, so this is an early window. The, the reason why we vaccinate girls that early, we want to um, be able to prevent it before there is, you know, sexual debut, before they start experimenting with sex, because I mentioned this is a sexually transmitted infection. So when you're able to vaccinate girls against HPV at an early age, it reduces the chances of them coming up with cervical cancer in the future. Also, there are different types of vaccines, you know, you can be able to vaccine up, uh, vaccinate a girl up to age 26. And in some vaccines, you know, um, there, are some, there are different types of vaccines. Some vaccines can allow vaccination up to age 45. However, the earliest and the best time to vaccinate is before there is sexual, um, any sexual experimentation, not just sexual intercourse. That's what people need to know. It's not just sexual intercourse. Even sexual experiment, let me call it sexual outer course, you know, that can also, you know, cause any exchange of fluids, anything that can cause any exchange of genital fluids can you know, increase the risk of human papilloma virus transfers. So that's, that's that for vaccination. 
Then we have uh, screening. Screening is where we have pap smear. So pap smear is a routine screening, ideally done every three to five years. We encourage women from age 21 upwards, especially if you have started having sex, to go every three to five years, go um, to a health center near you, hospital, a laboratory that or radiologist, radiology center that uh, conducts pap smears and have a pap smear. It will let you know if you are good to go or if there are any signs of cervical cancer or any stage of cervical cancer. And one beautiful thing, if I may use that word loosely, um, about cervical cancer is that if caught in the early stages, like the precancerous stage, it is very treatable. All right. Very, very treatable. So that's that's it for um, the that's it for the screening. And of course, I mentioned treatment. So those yes, are the three phases. Thank you so much for highlighting this. Just to quickly clarify, you mentioned that once a woman has become sexually active, she needs to go do these screenings. Does this talk about continuous sexual activity or for those who probably have not, you know, maybe they've experienced when they were much younger and decided they're not, they're not furthering their sexual activities. Do they still need to go check? Thank you, Oli, for mentioning that. It's a very important factor. So one of the risk factors for cervical cancer is early sexual debut. So when we say sexual activity or ask someone if they are sexually active, we're not just referring to the number of times you've had sex. That we're not referring to the frequency. We want to know, have you ever had sex before? That's what we mean at any point in your life. And it's even um, more sensitive or we get to even pay more attention if the time you had this sex was earlier in your, you know, your earlier years. Because cervical cancer takes a while to, or HPV takes a while to, you know, manifest as cervical cancer. It takes years. So for a girl who had early sexual um, exposure for any reason, consensually or not, she is also at risk and needs to be screened or vaccinated, whatever the case may be, because it gives it a longer window for manifestation. Some people feel that cancer is something that happens to older women. But if a girl child had early sexual intercourse, it's going to manifest, say, in her 20s, 30s. That's where you hear that uh, the cancer happened to a young All right. person. Okay. You know, so it's very important that you mentioned that. Thank you very much for highlighting this and clarifying Dr. Chioma Wakam, a medical doctor and founder of Smile With Me Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us on the show this morning.